Okay, so uh, my name is Christophe de Vincent, and I'm working for Red Hat, and today I'm going to talk about chains of trust in confidential computing. Um, so let me quickly review what we're going to talk about today. First, a quick overview of what confidential computing is about. What is attestation? Uh, the use cases for confidential computing, bonus points for whoever can identify this picture. Uh, going from root of trust to actual trust, a, f a number of platform specific details, and uh, the supporting technologies. This picture is more difficult to identify. It's the foundations of the Eiffel Tower. <laughs> so this is really a summary. I'm going to speak relatively quickly and brush quickly over various topics, uh, because the details are in a blog which you can find following this link. Um, so it's a six-part series blog on Red Hat blogs. So first, what is confidential computing? It's mostly about protecting data in use. Um, this is a quote from some guy you may maybe heard about. I compromise the confidentiality of their proprietary software to advance my agenda of becoming the best at breaking through the lock. From Kevin Mitnick. So, you know, hacking has always been a way of trying to go through the locks. And um, so the problem statement here is really that uh, we have infrastructure that is designed to protect against the workloads inside and not the other way around. So the software you have today mostly runs on hardware you do not run, uh, like for instance a cloud provider, a virtual machine host of some kind or whatever. And in there you have various resources. You have CPUs, memory, disks, networking, and so on. And for instance, let's say you run containers inside. All the mechanisms of sandboxing inside are designed to protect against the containers accessing these resources. They are not designed against the infrastructure looking at the containers. And that means that if you want to run, for instance, Apple and Samsung or competitors on the same hardware, you'll have a problem because uh, there is no guarantee that someone is not going to spy on both or transmit data from one to the other. So we have good solutions for disk and networking. You can do disk, uh, you know, I/O encryption and so on. Um, and for memory, essentially the memory that you have is in the clear to anyone or the host. Uh, you can dump the the process of QMU or whatever and see what's inside. Uh, actually, I'm going to give a talk at DevConf precisely about that. Um, now, with memory encryption, you have some kind of weak encryption, and so it's intentional that encryption being used here is relatively weak. Uh, but at least it's something that pr protects against uh, uh, immediate tampering uh, and accessing the data. Other levels of protection include being able to protect against, you know, interrupt tampering or injection of false, cor corrupting the CPU state, etc. This is, for instance, the difference between SCV ES and SCV. We're going to see that in a moment. So. Another important aspect, and that's that will be most of the focus of this talk, is attestation, which is essentially to prove that what you are running is what you want to run, and that you are running where you want to run in a setup that you can trust. Okay, the origins of the root of trust, you probably heard about the TPM, and that was hardware root of trust, and it measures and launches the next stage, and the next stage records its own state, and then it keeps going that way, and again and again, until you reach, for instance, the Linux kernel or the workload. And at some point, you have a record, a faithful record, stored in hardware of everything you did. So this is essentially how you build uh, the root of trust, for instance, for Secure Boot or things like that. The, sorry, the chain of trust. Now, if we want to do something like that for uh, more advanced workloads, and here I'm taking the example of Kala containers that uh, Fabiano just presented, uh, then we want to have some additional levels of trust um, that we can provide to the higher levels. So first, we need to provide a kind of trusted platform that will offer some kind of confi confidentiality guarantees that are enforced by hardware and cryptography. Um, and that way, the platform simply gives you the tools, but it does not really, you don't need to trust the platform except for the fact that it does the computations the right way. And then you have the host that will manage the physical resources, give you, you know, things like CPU, memory sizes, and so on. Um, but in the new uh, approach, you will not have to trust that your data in there is uh, visible. And finally, in green, you have all the aspects that belong to the tenant or the owner of the workload. 
and that's a confidential area and you want to make it completely inaccessible to the host even while it's running on it. Okay, so what are the kind of guarantees that confidential computing really provides? Well, it's really about confidentiality. That's the thing that matters. So it protects data in use from leaks or from tampering. It's not designed, for instance, to protect against any kind of crash. It's not designed to protect net the disk or the network data. You need to do that yourself and keep doing it, uh, or even better, uh, in a confidential computing setting. And of course, it does not offer any guarantee of quality of service, uh, not even forward progress. So, so it's possible that you can do, it's, it's preferable in this context to say the guest will no longer ma make any forward progress or the guest will crash than to leak data. That's essentially what it means. That message is difficult for people, for instance, in the kernel community. Uh, they really have, uh, uh, many of them have a hard time saying, I'm okay with the idea that we no longer trust PCI, for instance. Um, and it's hardware-based real-time cri cryptography, which means that with sufficient resources, you can probably break it, but not in real time. That's essentially what you're... Now, all these protections are highly implementation dependent, even within the same vendor. The chart you have on the right here is for AMD dev devices, depending on the generation, SCV, SCVES, SCVSNP. So, the bottom line of all this is there is, you know, when you say confidential computing, it doesn't bring automatic security any more than the guardrail protects you against accidents. How fast was this, this car driving? <laughs> So, what is attestation? Essentially, in our case, it's proving that you run what you want to run and where you want to run it. That's essentially the two questions we try to prove. Now, let's start with a bit of terminology, uh, and I'm going to present the RATS model uh, from the ETF, so that's remote att attestation procedures. Um, and so, we start with a verifier component that essentially is going to implement the logic of checking you endorse a particular piece of hardware, and so you provide some, some kind of endorsement. You also, as an owner, need to, pr to have a number of reference values that you're going to be able to provide to this verifier, for instance, the identity of a VM or stuff like that. And you also, as an owner, will be responsible for the appraisal policies of the evidence that is being presented. Now, when an attester tries to present that evidence, it presents it to the verifier, you run through the things that the owner provided, and you end up giving attestation results to a relying party that is whatever is going to, for instance, deliver keys or secrets or whatever. And the relying party owner also has its role in appraising the evidence or the attestation results. One example of this, and I'm going to talk about this later, is that uh, you can decide to no longer accept the workload that you used to accept because you've discovered some kind of vulner vulnerability in it. So the basic concept uh, of attestation is really that you're offering some kind of proofs about the configuration of a system. So in general, generally speaking, not just for confidential computing, attestation proves some kind of property of a system. That's what it means. And when we talk about remote attestation, that means that we decouple the evidence from verification and a lock and a key is a good example where the key itself is remote from the lock and say you gave a key to someone and you no longer want them access to the, your property, you can change the lock and now they can no longer use that key to enter that property. Now there are two big models uh, for this evidence check. Uh, one is called the passport check model where you present the evidence uh, given to you by the verifier to the relying party. So it's like you're presenting a passport, and that's, for instance, what Microsoft Azure does uh, for most of their secrets. And you have the background check mode where you instead validate the evidence in the relying party itself. So I'm also going to use, and I use it most more in the blog than, than in this talk, but um, I propose an, uh, what I call the remits pi pipeline. Uh, it's a simplistic model um, of trust chains that can be used to compare value trust chains with one another. So R stands for root of trust. It's mostly things like certificates, etc. Um, e for endorsement. That's, for instance, a signing key uh, that might be in a CPU or something like that. M for measurements. Uh, that typically, in our case, you summarize a measurement with hashes and you certify the hashes. 
i is for identity so for instance reference values that you're going to prefer to compare with the reference values you have in your provider t for trust and that implant that's that covers things like policies deciding whether you trust this or that specific hash and s for secrets that's usually how you unlock the system you give back a decryption key or something like that and i find that remits you know it's you remit the secrets it's sort of easy to remember so some examples uh, of this for secure boot for instance you start with a tpm the endorsement is made by the manufacturer that says you know i actually signed that chip or i endorse the chip um, the firmware bootloader is where the uh, uh, most of the measurements uh, are going to be uh, the, the measurements that matter are measurements of the firmware and the bootloader um, and then you're going to expose that through a signed attestation that's essentially the evidence you can carry around or a hash or something like that. And then you have attestation policies, for instance, in your provider that will decide, do I trust this particular boot or not? And finally, you release that through, for instance, a cloud API secret. And that's what you get back that will allow the, the workload to proceed. It can be the root disk, it can be your workload, it can be anything. Now, when you sell a property, uh, you have the same kind of chain. So that chain is relatively general. So for instance, you start with a notary as a root of trust. You have signed records um, as the endorsements. You have deeds or affidavits as a, as a measurement. A, a description of the property is essentially the identity that you find on these deeds. And the fact that you exchange money is, is the, the, the way you decide to trust or not what you got, and then you give money for it. And you, the secret you get is you get the key of the new, new property. So that's the same principle. And the, the, our whole money system is really based on that, where we used to have gold or silver as essentially the root equivalent of what you have. The government was the endorser of that paper note that you get. The market value is giving you an, uh, an evaluation of uh, how much $20 mean. And the number of dollars is really the identity of the, the transaction. Handing over cash is what you do with that, and getting foods or goods or whatever is the secret that, it, that gets released. So that you see that that pipeline can apply outside of computer science. So uh, when we apply that to um, our conf confidential computing case, I'm using Kala containers or confidential containers as an example here. We measure what we run using various crypto cr cryptographic tools. Sorry. And uh, so we can have, for instance, pre-attestation. That's the case of SCV uh, or generation. You measure the payload before allowing it to start. Or you can have post-attestation where the code in the payload can confirm its identity. And that includes, in that case, it can include something that is much larger. Um, and that's what is going to unlock the secrets ultimately. Uh, you can actually extend that to the whole workload. So you can decide, I only unlock secrets if I know which workload I'm running. Okay, so there are various use cases for continuous computing. The it's essentially, it's a continuum from uh, virtual machine to whole clusters. So the base is confidential virtual machines. And it's funny that this picture is what you get on DuckDuckGo when you search confidential virtual machine. I don't know why. <laughs> so um, then you have you can have functions. And a good example of that is confidential workloads, a product called Karen VM. You can have something that is more orchestrated, and that's the case for continental containers that uh, um, Fabiano mentioned earlier. And you can have the whole enchilada, you can have the whole cluster. Uh, so for instance, today we have uh, something called Constellation that will deploy complete um, virtual machines. So the confidential virtual machine is really the basic technology be be behind it all. It starts with new firmware and hardware um, APIs exposing new features, and they are mostly uh, platform dependent today. The host kernel is no longer trusted, but it still has to expose new features to, to expose the, 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 the new features, so for instance, through new devices. Debit CV is a good example of that. Uh, the hypervisor is no longer trusted, and again, that's something that is really a hard pill to swallow for prominent numbers. Uh, Greg Cage, I'm not mentioning your name here, uh, of the community who say, you know, that model is completely broken, PCI has to be trusted. No, no, I, I, if the hypervisor is lying to you, it can put anything in the PCI space and essentially try to try the guest, to, to crash the, the guest that way. Um, now the VM becomes a confidential enclave. 
Inside you have guest firmware, the boot sequence is measured. You can ask God how to do that, for instance, or, uh, or then. Or, uh, the guest kernel also can be measured. And um, so that's essentially the, the basic technology. Now the next step is um, trying to have a lightweight and quick container-like experience. And uh, the example you see there is Kerrin VM. So in that case, what you see is not really uh, running uh, a confidential workload. I'm really running it on this laptop to show that I can essentially have uh, an Ubuntu environment from a Mac laptop. And that's real time. The speed you see is real time. So it's really very fast uh, in terms of user experience. So the VM is presented as a library to the OS uh, through a project called libkaren. There is a direct in integration with Podman, so you have a container-like experience. You don't have orchestration, it's really Podman, so it's the command line. Um, it got very early support for SCV, including that was, at, to my knowledge, the first working remote attestation um, that was implemented in this project. Now, back to Kata containers, uh, that's the next step. That's designed more for orchestration. Um, Fabiano mentioned the Sandbox API. That's essentially the new API to interact with things like Kubernetes, et cetera. And that gives us a way to schedule a large number of containers, um, orchestrate them, and so on. And so in that case, you have the same set of components that need to be changed the, the same way as before. It's really the same technology, uh, except this time we run it to treat a VM as a pod so that we have this runtime that runs container through VMs. Um, so the big difference for the confidential containers project is that now it needs to rely on this relying party on the side and perform this kind of remote attestation to decide do I run this workload or not. So same steps I would already described, but please remember these are really the important uh, steps. And if you go one level up, uh, you can have the whole cluster deployed that way. So what you see on the right is a um, constellation, uh, edgeless constellation, which is uh, essentially the creating. So it's this one is not real time. It takes quite a few minutes to actually boot things. Um, but it, what it does is set up for you a set of SCVS NP enabled VMs. And in minutes, you have a cluster uh, with the whole integrated, checked, and so on for you. So that's really convenient. In that case, you make the whole cluster confidential. Uh, it works at the cloud provider level. So the example that I gave here, I think, is Azure, if I recall correctly. Um, and it generates, as I said, fully confidential nodes with encryption and everything. They have some interesting aspects to it, like an attested form of TLS that lets multiple workloads attest one another and make sure that the other side is running on a trusted node as well. And for instance, they also have this joint service, uh, which is a way to attest nodes. I'm going to talk again about this in a moment. And a verification service, which is for users to verify that the cluster they run on is trusted. So how do you actually build trust? You want to keep the trust alive along the way. That's the part that is difficult. So how does this work in practice? Typically, you have a cryptographic measurement of the enclave. Uh, so it can be varying uh, aspects of the enclave. Uh, in the case of Kata containers, we, we are trying to at least be able to check the workload we are talking about. Um, and then you're going to send some sort of ID uh, in the passport model uh, saying, you know, that's me, uh, or it can be a measurement, it can be whatever. And in return, after attestation, you get some kind of keys. But of course, as I said, the benefit of having this remote attestation is that you can decide to deny it even for something that you allowed before. So you can change your mind if something gets broken along the way. Uh, so the attestation flow in that case is to unlock the workload by giving secrets. So the attester first sends a request to the relying party. The relying party first responds with a challenge. The challenge is essentially so that we have a nonce somewhere in the process to avoid replay attacks and these kind of things. And then the attester can encrypt the evidence using the, the nonce and uh, essentially produce um, a quote that way to the relying party. Now that gets presented to the verifier. The verifier says, okay, or not okay. And if it's okay, you can get the secrets from some kind of secret broker that can be a completely different service. It's the case in, in the case of Azure, for instance, that's a completely different step. And then you give back the secrets that your workload is going to run with. So that's a relatively simple. and Below is the remit model for this kind of thing. 
So one important aspect of attestation is that there are so many variants. One of the key factors to understand is who proves what to whom. And uh, you have different kind of proofs for different consumers. So for instance, there is something I call system-facing attestation. That's system software wanting to build some kind of trusted execution environment. You want to make sure that, and that's the case when you boot, you do a secure boot inside a confidential VM. You have user facing, that's the user wants to verify that the system they are using or connecting to is trusted. So you provide now, that's a verification service in the case of Constellation. You have workload facing, which is something that is more API driven. It's a workload wanting to prove I'm running on a confidential system and I won't run otherwise. That's what Kata containers does, for instance, or continental containers with Kata. You have peer facing, so workloads are trying to talk to one another and checking if the other workload is trusted, and that's ATLS in the case of, of Constellation. And you have cluster facing, it's whether a node in the cluster accepts another node joining, and that's the joint service in the case of HLS. So the thing is that, of course, as you can guess, there are many platform-specific details. That's what makes it salty and interesting. Uh, beyond that po point, there will be zo zombies, <laughs> as they said in the old maps. So um, different vendors have relatively different approaches. AMD Secure Encrypted Virtualization, for instance, has a separate uh, secure processor that does a lot of the work. And uh, SCVE has added, well, S you know, well, uh, SCVE has added encrypted state. So for instance, a register file is itself encrypted. And uh, SNP, or Secure Nested Pages, adds, among other things, production of uh, hostile memory mapping and integrity production for interrupts and stuff like that. Intel has a different approach with TDX, Trusted Domain Extension, um, where they run things on the main processor and have a new uh, secure arbitration mode that will uh, be a slightly different, well, it has higher privilege if you want, and can control the trusted enclaves. And they implement modules with that so that we essentially have to treat as binary blobs for the moment at least. Um, so it's a, a different approach in the sense that it runs all on the main CPU, not uh, a separate CPU. And then there is IBM uh, Secure Execution, which uh, has two generations of it. You have the details in the blog you, if you want to have more links. Power has a product and execution facility. Harm has confidential computing architecture. And all these technologies share one thing in common that uh, they are based on virtualization. And for some reason, they all work completely differently in internally. So, <laughs> so you really have to, at the moment, it's not really easy to present a single view of everything. So AMD SCV is interesting. It's a really the messy kid of, the <laughs> uh, of this, uh, this space. Uh, it it's the first generation. It was somewhat flawed. Uh, it provides memory encryption through hardware. Uh, again, built on top of virtualization, there is a a non-virtualization equivalent called secure memory encryption. It relies, as I said, on a separate security processor and only features pre-attestation. Um, now, the problem is that there, are, there were many vulnerabilities discovered that gave it a really bad rep, and that bad rep um, persists to this day in the kernel community. So when you submit things related to, um, to SCV, even SNP today, the first response from various community members is, your stuff is broken, fix it. <laughs> Not looking even at the, the reasoning or whatever. Uh, ES and SNP were essentially the cleanup crew uh, to this uh, initial state. So, protecting the CPU state, uh, ES does not really change the attestation model. SNP products against malicious space mapping and other things. But the most important thing for us is that attestation um, can now be done from within the guest. The guest can get the attestation quote and send it over. So that gives you much more flexibility in terms of how you do attestation. And the other interesting thing is uh, virtu virtual machine privilege levels that give additional production levels uh, from within VMs and can build interesting stuff like virtual TPMs. There are talks later today. I'm going to talk uh, to, to mention them. Finally, the other big player is Intel TDX, Trust Domain Extensions. Uh, so SGX um, is the base technology, uh, the non-VM uh, virtual machine based one to create secure enclaves. And that's still used. It's, it's funny because it's deprecated outside of Xeon, but it's still used for TDX to build the enclaves that they use. 
so TDX is virtualization-based. Um, there is no separate security processor. The, as I said, no security ar secure arbitration mode. And vi various binary modules to expose the required uh, services. So you have to a big trust Intel component to it. It's actually the case with AMD as well. The attestation in that case is, b is performed by a quoting enclave, which is, again, the secure enclave running on the same architecture. Finally, uh, let me quickly brush over various supporting technologies. Um, so that thing may concern many of, of you. Um, of course, we need host and guest Linux kernel support. So for instance, uh, we still have a lot of the important features not mainstreamed uh, on the host side. We need hypervisor support, obviously. We need guest firmware support, um, host provisioning and support tools, like for instance, LCV CTL, uh, to be able to say, I actually endorse this host. Uh, generic key brokering service uh, and attestation. Uh, that's an, an area where uh, ca the Kata containers community is probably going to provide some stuff to the rest of the world because we were sort of first in this area and we are now trying to make sure that this can be used, for instance, for clusters. Uh, can we use the, the confidential containers um, attestation mechanisms for clusters? These kind of things. And then there are all sorts of compatibility layers. Like, for instance, there is all this work that has been done for, bit for physical TPMs. And so one of the ways to present uh, that uh, level of, of confidentiality to a guest is to have a virtual TPM. And uh, there are talks later today that talk about this. And one implementation, for instance, is Secure Virtual Machine Service Module. Um, there is a talk later today. So let me refer you to the blog for pointers. Um, uh, again, I'll give you another opportunity to flash code. Upcoming attractions later today on in this space, so watch out for these talks. At 2, we have Trusted I.O. Uh, with General Power. Uh, at 2.30, we have Secure VM Secure Service Module, the SVSM I just talked about, Jörg Rudder. Uh, and at 3, we have Zero Trust Virtual TBA, TPM, uh, again, what I just mentioned about TPM. So. In conclusion, attestation means many different things to many different people. Uh, the key takeaway is, first of all, that we only scratch the surface. Confidential computing is really a large collection of technologies. Attestation can invade different things, even in the same context. Uh, preserving the chain of trust reliably requires a lot of careful thinking. Technologies are not consistent, so we need to really have adapters all over the place. And uh, for details uh, on what I just showed, uh, there is this um, QR code here. I'm going to show it again in a moment. So, but if you want to take it, so same QR code here. Now is a good time for questions. We have like zero minutes. <laughs> One of the big issues I always um, wanted to know in the long term station with uh, SDs and people like this, right, is that um, you have multiple different pans along the way. So you mentioned I'm, I'm a customer, I want to run RHEL in my VM, and I want RHEL to tell me whether I'm supposed to trust the code base I'm running, because I might be running an update command along the way. How, how, how do you envision that we, as an industry, work? In a direction where multiple parts, multiple parties would basically con be, be like adapters and providers of attestation in chunks to then create an actual attestation uh, profile. So, this is related on the internet, right? They heard it. I don't. I don't. I don't have to repeat the question. They heard it on the. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, th that's a very good question. Um, so I think this is one of the, the reasons for the push behind things like VTPM is that they, they essentially rely on an interface that has an ecosystem built around it. And so you have uh, things like Keylime, et cetera, that will let you validate physical TPM just as well as, as, as virtual TPMs in a way that is somewhat independent from uh, the operating system you're running inside. Um, now, Keylime is a specific form of attestation. I did not really mention that, but there are sort of non-blocking attestation. It's after the fact. You know, you run your, your workload, and after the fact, they tell you, oh, this was the wrong one. Uh, so, but they don't have a blocking mode yet. Uh, they're working on it. Um, the as far as knowing 
that you can trust this or that guy, it's really the usual crypto stuff in the sense that you will rely on things like certificates, certificate chains, and so on. So all the attestation technologies that I know of today are built on relatively standard crypto standard. Now there are many cryptographic standards for that, but typically you verify things using uh, standard crypto libraries and so on. So uh, they are not reinventing the wheel, if, if, you, if you wish. Does that answer the question or not? I think the technical way on how to do it is almost trivial, because as you say, the way it's well paid, right? What I'm, what I'm missing is convergence to easy-to-use mechanisms. Right now, yes. all of this is for basically trained people in the world that is that yeah. you talk about. So the, the problem is that you have two opposite trends there. So one side is the confidential container side, for instance, the open source community. And what we did is we built, the first thing we, we did is we published uh, the protocol we were going to use for attestation. But being lazy bums, we essentially did not implement it. And then Sergio Lopez uh, wanted for confidential workloads to have remote attestation. And so he said, oh, they have the protocol written up, let, let me use that. And he, implement, he implemented our the, the continental container remote attestation protocol and server, etc. And I said, oh, your stuff is broken. It doesn't have a way to register workloads. And so you sort of added some API calls to it that were not part of the attestation protocol, but what you need to have key provider, you know, how do you register keys and stuff like that, right? Uh, which in our design was separate, but of course he needed that. So in his broker, he put everything together in one piece. And as I said, that was the first one that, that, that worked. And then we actually did work with this for a short while. Um, and uh, relatively recently, maybe two, three months ago, there was a major de a decision to, to essentially not follow up with that, but instead have a design where we have per hardware driver, both on the key broker client and key broker service side, to address all the differences between various platforms. Um, and then we have a common layer for the, the transmission of information, exchange of keys, UIs, all these kind of things. So now the way this was done is relatively generic, but within Red Hat, for instance, we are discussing how to build attestation services for clusters. We're looking at what Edgeless Constellation is doing. And in that context now, the question is, does the stuff that Continental Container did apply? Can we actually extend it to, to, to have joint service equivalents, to have verification service equivalents, these kind of things. And um, surprisingly, the answer is not quite, but not too far away. So, yeah. thank you.